Tonight, echoes of empire. As MPs debate a ban on trophy hunting imports, the president of Botswana hits back and tells Britain to stay out of it. It comes after his government suggested sending 10,000 elephants to London to help us understand the problems they face. What I perceive as not just condescending and patronizing, but really a resurgence of colonial conquest. How will that view go down here, where 80% of people back a ban? I'll debate with my panel tonight. Also ahead, like something from science fiction. A brain chip allows an American man paralyzed from the neck down to take control of a computer using just his thoughts. There's somewhere in the screen, and it would move where I wanted it to, um, which was such a wild experience. Also ahead, we go inside the Gaza Field Hospital where doctors from Britain have joined the effort to save lives. And the family of a British woman missing for three years in the US Virgin Islands appeal for help from President Biden. Will they get the help they want? That's all coming up on The World with me, Yalda Hakeem. Good evening. It's a practice that horrifies the majority of Brits. I'm talking about trophy hunting. Whether it's by poachers or tourists paying to shoot, the end result often shocks and appalls. We've all seen the photos of someone proudly posing alongside their kill. Well, now MPs here want to try to change things. They're preparing to debate a proposed ban on UK safari hunters bringing body parts of animals they shoot like tusks back home. Polling in recent years suggests more than 80% of people here back a ban. And yet the move by MPs here is shocking politicians where those wildest of animals roam. Tonight, the president of Botswana tries to justify why elephants must be killed. He says it's about protecting the safety of his own people. And for the UK to suggest otherwise isn't just condescending, but also brings back memories of colonialism. Here's President Masisi telling me why he thinks Britain shouldn't judge Botswana. I wish they would be as horrified when elephants maul and maraud people. I find it unfathomable that you'd be horrified by the protection of one's livelihood, rural poor people, who have uh, allowed 40% of the country to be set aside for conservation when they defend themselves, or even when out of a lack of resources, they invite those who are well enough to own arms and hunt for trophies in a controlled, selective manner. Nothing to come close to diminishing the population because despite the 400 elephants per year quota, we are allowed by CITES, we have never come close to that. Well, so why again, aren't they horrified? Well, again, um, critics, critics say that you are not looking at the bigger picture here, that you are not thinking about the survival of, of this species, which is, which is crucial to, uh, to the ecosystem, the wider ecology, because elephants are seen as gardeners of, of the forest. Yes, and we happen to be the ones who have kept those animals surviving. And those who are supposed to be the paragons of virtue of our gardening entitlements have none. We have the most elephants in the world in the wild. How did that come about? Now, who has greater legitimacy to proclaim capacity to play ruler or decision maker to these species? And listen to me, I mean, it is amazing that when people have in their own backyards allowed for the hunting of species and exportation of trophies, they would turn around and look at ours and say, we couldn't. We have the most elephants. Uh, again, I, I, you know, your, your, the former president of Botswana has described the practice as, as an unethical and says that basically this has got to do with corruption right at the top. The former president is a man on the run from corruption. Why doesn't he come here to a country he led? He knows the judicial system. He knows the processes and defend himself. I did not accuse him. 
I did not investigate him. The rule of law is well entrenched and established in this republic. And he cannot be the one saying that when he knows more than anybody else that he <laughs> peddled a lot of dubious things. Uh, and most of all now, uh, untruths. President, I also want your reaction to politicians from Botswana reportedly threatening to send 10,000 wild elephants uh, to, to Hyde Park here in London. I thought I could, uh, you know, credit you with a lot more humour because my Minister of Environment, Honourable Dumise Nimtimkulu, made that statement in zest. And he did say it was a rhetorical statement when he said 10,000 elephants uh, released in Hyde Park. No, nobody, everybody knows you're not going to be lifting 10,000 elephants to bring there. But, but what did, he was but trying to... Tell us what the point, the point he was trying to the make. The point right? is, because we live with these elephants, as we irk out our living, and you want them not controlled, you must experience the same. Put another way, come over and visit. Come and live with them. Come and live with us. All our critics, even the mover of this bill, I bet you has never set foot in Botswana to fully understand how we live and cherish our elephants. Why do you think and he must this, thank us. Why, why, do hey? you think, why do you think this bill has been put forward and is up for debate? To be honest with you, I honestly think it's condescending. I think it's really condescending. I think uh, there have been an upsurge and a, a peddling of untruths about how we truly treat our elephants. A peddling of untruths of, of you know, how we interact with elephants to have resulted in them being what they are. And a negation of communication about how elephants do harm to the ecosystem. How much elephants do harm to human beings who are poor who try and act out a living in rural, dry well, Botswana. What, what, what do you think you need to do in order to clarify what you're saying are misunderstandings of, of the, the issues that you have in Botswana in terms of these, these elephants? First of all, it's just basic biology and, uh, you know, population dynamics. If a species or even a production line in a factory is unmanaged in its reproduction, they will get to a time where there's oversupply. And therefore, there will be a shortage of the resources necessary for its own survival, right? Two is that they will occupy far greater land in mass than they would if they were limited in number. Three, elephants are large, iconic, and can be very dangerous species. And if you looked at the way in which they, when come into conflict with human beings, who suffers and how they suffer, you'd never wish it upon your worst enemy. So, are you saying? Oh. So are you saying that that hunting is essentially a form of culling? Well, listen, uh, culling has a connotation of ethical abhorrence associated with it because it is the indiscriminate elimination of a whole group, you know, mother, father, grandfather, the whole herd. It's not the same with hunting. It's just a lexical difference. But the end, in the terms end of the result... result is out, more or less, is it the same? The end of a shoot is a death. But the difference between culling and shooting or hunting is that you pick which you hunt. So you I take just... out the I just want to get your reaction then. Say this this debate, it's it's a proposed ban. If this ban does go through, your reaction to that? I'd be abhorred, abhorred, disappointed and disturbed by, you know, the uh, rejuvenation of what I perceive as not just condescending and patronising, but really a resurgence of colonial conquest. It amounts to that. We are a democratic, rep sovereign republic, right? You have stags. Whenever did you have us passing a bill 
on the importation of stocks only because we are poor, only because we don't have rich people who can go out there, hunt them, bring them here, only because our economy is so much smaller than yours. President, I, I also just want to ask you, I mean, when you see very wealthy people who can afford to go out and hunt, travel to your country, and then take pictures with these dead animals, how do you feel about that? Well, listen, I'm not the one to moralize about the posing of those persons. And yet again, that presents an opportunity for controlling that too, because it some of them can be really ugly, but yet there are some which can be decent, right? And without blood all over the place and... Well, that, that is, those animals. are the images that are being seen and are horrifying people. Well, I don't know how old those images are, because things change over time, right? But yet again, I must point out that what we have is controlled hunting. Juxtapose this against the proposition of those who are opposed to what we do. They are proposing photographic tourism. There are some places where photographic tourism just is not viable. But besides that, they never want to see the effects of only photographic tourism where you have in the background a malnourished, emaciated child with a picture taken from an of an elephant or buffalo which just ravaged the village, which ravaged the field, which killed the grandmother trying to herd her goats. You don't get that communicated by the very same people. So you get this paradoxical image where you get opulence and ostentatiousness by the rich, opulent, photographic tourists, some of them, I must say, and the poverty, abject, that's right in surrounding that. Okay. That's brought about by unwanted controlled numbers of species. President Masisi, we're very grateful for your time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, but you must come to Botswana <laughs> and we'll take you on a tour. You see these things. That was the president of Botswana there. Well, with me this evening in the studio to discuss uh, all of our issues is the deputy editor of The Spectator, Freddie Gray, and Michael Walker, political commentator at Navarra Media. Thank you both for joining us here on the uh, programme. Freddie, I'll come to you first. Just your reaction to some of the things the president was saying. Well, I think it's tremendously refreshing to hear a different perspective on trophy hunting because... I think most of our debate on it is now formed by people posting disgusting images on social media of a trophy hunted, of a hunt, a hunted animal looking brutalised with some sort of hillbilly with a gun and sort of proclaiming their disgust uh, at what they're seeing. And that's very easy to share because it's very emotive. But this is a complicated issue. And I think President Masisi made it very clear there that from Botswana's point of view, uh, it's quite important to control the population of elephants. This is an economically lucrative way for them to do it. Um, and if you want to talk about sort of remnants of imperialism, what could be more imperialistic than lecturing uh, Botswanans about how to run uh, something that's rather important in their country? And, and is, you know, farming is very important in Botswana. They need to manage the population. And so I think, you know, without wanting to sort of... Uh, sounds silly. I think well, congratulations to you for presenting the other side of the argument because it's very, very unpopular in this country. Deeply unpopular. In fact, if you look at the polls, more than 80% of people are saying that they support a uh, trophy hunting ban. Which is proof you've got a very unrepresentative panel because, unfortunately, <laughs> I also think the president of Botswana put the case very well. Um, I, personally, when it comes to animal rights, I feel like I don't have a leg to stand on as a meat eater. You know, you hear lots of people say, oh, I can't believe someone would shoot an elephant that's so outrageous when they ate pulled pork for lunch, right? Pigs are also very intelligent. So I think there's a sort of... People can be a bit squeamish about it, and I, I can't really see where the moral consistency is. I think at the same time... So I think many people have... I, and I have to admit myself, before I was reading about this today, sort of assumed that maybe elephants were somewhat endangered. There are 130,000 in Botswana. There used to be 50,000. Um, the president there was sort of saying that this does cause disruption. As you can imagine, you, can imagine, you know, it's a, it's a large country, but 130,000 elephants running around, um, that is going to be disruptive. So, to me, it seems like a, you know, a pretty smart solution to say we can control the elephant population, we can make some decent money from foreign tourists, and to be fair to Botswana, it is one of the countries in Africa that's had the most sort of steady, stable growth 
one of the best places to grow up in, really, in sub-Saharan Africa. So I think, you know, we should be a bit more humble here, pot potentially. Yes, um, but if I go back to the polling that's been done, the fact that the majority of Brits view it in, in a certain way, they, they probably welcome MPs debating this ban. I just want to show an image and I'm just going to warn our audience uh, because it is uh, graphic and it will upset uh, people of Cecil the Lion. Um, this image uh, is from 2015 following a, uh, a kill uh, and this image did horrify the world um, and it is these sorts of things, Freddie, that does upset people. Well, again, I think this is why we're, we're a very visual culture, particularly in the West, very social media has driven that. And, and images like that are upsetting. But hunting of big game is a more complicated subject than uh, just, you know, a horrific killing of a lion. Uh, I mean, lions are endangered in some countries and should, and should be preserved because I think that's where, you know, the moral argument becomes quite clear. If an animal is in danger of being extinct and you are hunting it, um, then, yes, there's a very good case for not doing it. There's a separate question about whether people should take pleasure in killing animals. That's a difficult moral question to answer, and I don't really claim to have a clear answer on that, I'm afraid. Maybe Michael does. Well, I think, as I say, when it comes to the morality, people somehow seem to think that sort of if you eat it, it's moral, and if you do it for pleasure, it's not. Now, people can survive on a vegetarian and vegan diet, so they, they really are eating meat for sort of pleasure anyway. Um, that said, I mean, obviously, I find killing a lion or killing an elephant and posing with it distasteful. You know, I, 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 I don't see a picture of someone posing with a dead large animal and thinking, oh, they seem like a fabulous guy and I'd like to hang out with them. You know, so there's something unseemly about it, but I don't necessarily think we can make moral judgments just based on our personal tastes. Yeah. Well, the president of Botswana has made his case and, and so have both of you. Uh, do stay with us. We have lots more uh, in the next edition. Uh, this is The World with me, Yael Hakim. After the break, the future of AI, the first patient to receive a brain chip from Elon Musk's company, is able to move a computer cursor and play chess with his mind. We'll discuss where this advanced technology is heading. I'm Dan Whitehead and I'm Sky's West of England correspondent. I'm Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. We help you to understand the world with us. I'm Adam Parsons, I'm Sky's Europe correspondent based here in Brussels. We take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. I'm Lisa Dowd and I'm one of Sky's Midlands correspondents. The reason I do this job is because you never know where it's going to lead.
Welcome back. It sounds like something from a science fiction film, a chip in your brain that allows you to communicate simply with your thoughts. Well, now it's a reality. Meet 29-year-old Noland Arbo. A diving accident left him paralysed below the shoulder, but in January he was fitted with a brain chip. Today, video appeared to show him moving a cursor on a laptop and playing chess. It's all thanks to the tech company Neuralink, the brainchild of tech boss Elon Musk. But this isn't just some billionaire's obsession. Companies across the world are working in the same space. Remember this? Last year, scientists helped a man in Switzerland walk again despite breaking his spinal cord. Artificial intelligence played a key role in the breakthrough, and it continues to do so across healthcare. AI can spot cancers early and speed up the development of new drugs. There's obvious benefits, but as we'll discuss tonight, also some risks. Just how much power are we willing to hand over to machines? We'll be discussing this and the ethics of it in a moment. But first, here's our science correspondent, Thomas Moore, on the man who became a cyborg. I'd like to introduce you to the first ever user of the Neuralink device. Meet Noland, completely paralysed below the shoulders in a diving accident eight years ago but now able to control his laptop and play games with the power of thought. Actually, can you pause this on just for the yeah, audio absolutely. coming through? And that was also done with your brain? Yep. A device about the size of a pound coin was implanted in his brain by Elon Musk's Neuralink company in January. It reads signals in his neurons, decoding his intention to move his hands and arms and sends instructions wirelessly to a receiver attached to his computer. I could get it to move wherever I wanted, just stare somewhere in the screen and it would move where I wanted it to, um, which was such a wild experience. Other scientists are also transforming lives with brain chips. In Switzerland, Gert Jan Oskam can walk because signals in his neurons have been rerouted around a break in his spinal cord, giving him back control of his leg muscles. So these are the electrodes. And at Imperial College in London, another team is using a headset to read brainwaves. I think it can become commonplace that people can either enter virtual environments uh, and then interact with those environments just by thinking rather than actually physically doing the movements. And this can open up many possibilities. Then it's my turn. The challenge is just to think about moving my hands. Those brain waves inflate the green balls in this game until they explode. Well, that took intense focus, a lot of mental effort, and I think I'd get tired if I did it for too long. It's a bit like when you learn to drive and you're thinking through the, the brake, the controls, the clutch and so on. That becomes second nature, and so would this in time. This is still experimental technology, heavily regulated because of potential infection or brain damage from the implant procedure. But Noland has had no problems. Like, there's nothing to be afraid of with that. The surgery was super easy. I literally was released from the hospital a day later. Noland says the device isn't perfect. He's still uh, learning to use it. But he's no longer dependent on other people to help him play computer games. That is liberating. And it's just the start. Thomas Moore, Sky News. Complete help from Save My Life. And Thomas joins me now. And, and Thomas, I mean, you've been following the story for, for 15 years, actually. You filmed it a long time ago when this concept first emerged. Yeah, you don't get here overnight. 15 years ago, I was in Pittsburgh filming a monkey uh, where they were trying out this technique uh, for the first time. And it was able to control a robotic arm to feed itself a banana. And then that moved on. So 2016, President, o President Obama fist bumped a, a man who was uh, controlling a robotic arm just through the power of thought. So this is moving quite rapidly now as, as scientists understand how to put these implants inside the brain to start reading a very, very complicated jumble of signals that our neurons are fire, firing off all at the same time. And there's an awful lot of noise there. You've got to pick out the signal, that intent to move. I mean, it, it sounds extraordinary, but also frightening. Yes, I mean, for, for people who have some disability, whether that be through a spinal cord injury or a, a traumatic head injury or perhaps even a stroke, this could be revolutionary. This could be the way that they are able to start functioning independently once more. And that would be huge for them. But if you start talking about healthy people being augmented in some way to download their memories, maybe to record their thoughts for 
decades in advance uh, where we might begin to lose them. Uh, that is a completely different order of, of, of uh, ability. And I think that's where things get a little bit dangerous because there is a risk here. If you're implanting things inside somebody's brain, infection, perhaps even unintended injury to the brain. So there has to be an element of caution there. And where there's a disability that you're trying to correct, Clearly, it's worth a risk. Yeah, and this ongoing debate around uh, regulating tech companies and, and the pace in which all of this is moving. Um, Thomas, thank you so much. Now, we heard there how technology and AI could transform healthcare as well as the lives of those in the disabled community. How else could it change our world? Well, speaking on stage alongside Rishi Sunak at last year's AI summit, Elon Musk suggested artificial intelligence could spell the end for work itself. Have a listen. I think we are seeing the most disruptive force in history here. Um, you know, where we have for the first time, we will have for the first time something that is smarter than the smartest human. Um, and that, I mean, it's hard to say exactly what that moment is, but, but there will come a point where no job is needed. You can have a job if you want to have a job for sort of personal satisfaction, but the AI will be able to do everything. Elon Musk there, well, the end of work, is that positive or negative? It's, if it's the latter, what other drawbacks might there be uh, handing more power over to machines? Well, there is, of course, concern about uh, AI and whether it could manipulate uh, on the battlefield. A report last year from the Nuclear Threat Initiative called on governments to take urgent steps to manage the threat of AI-developed global biological catastrophe. So how concerned should we be by the risks of AI and how quickly do we need to regulate to avoid a catastrophe? Well, I've been speaking to computer scientist Dame Wendy Hall and the author and AI editor at the FT, Marumita Murgia. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for joining us here on the programme. Marumita, I'm going to begin with you because this whole idea of brain machine implants, it's not entirely new. It's just that we seem to be doing things um, quicker and more effective now. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, in fact, I met with a woman who had a brain implant and who was able to move a robotic arm back in 2013 in America. Um, so this technology has been developed over decades, really, um, making slow and steady progress. So it's not it's not brand new sci-fi. It's something that's been kind of uh, developed over years. But I think Neuralink um, has really brought it into the public eye in a way that Elon Musk does. Wendy, when you see these sorts of innovations, are you excited? Do you want to know more? I mean, what is your reaction? Well, I'm excited, of course, because the technology is moving forward. And, and uh, as your other guest said, we, this has been around for decades in the research labs. Um, and Neuralink, for sure, is pushing it forward and making, as Elon Musk always does, they all do uh, a lot of publicity around it. And the applications for people with disabilities are fantastic. But there are, uh, we do have to be cautious about this technology. I mean, these chips are effectively reading brain waves. But, but how can we be more responsible when it comes to this kind of technology and, and development well, this, in, in AI? We've We've got to set up the organisations, and that's what I do a lot of work with, um, that's going to uh, work with governments. Governments will regulate, they'll pass laws, as we're beginning to see, um, and then there has to be some sort of global governance of this type of technology. What, what can we allow? I mean, you know, the idea of a machine reading your mind and then potentially other people being able to read your mind is quite mind-blowing, and that is the, where this sort of technology will lead to. Now, that's years away, decades away, probably, but you can see, as a, as a researcher, I can see that's going to happen. So we need to start talking about how we would regulate that type of technology when it becomes commercial. Uh, well, I guess with anything, uh, anything new, any kind of new invention, there's always going to be good and, and bad, and it can fall in the... Uh, you know, right hands, where, where we're seeing development of, of um, medical technology, but it can also fall in the wrong hands. 
Well, I think that there's huge potential here. It's obvious when you when when I met somebody who was using this for the first time. You know, we've seen the videos of Neuralink as well. You can see how it can genuinely transform somebody's life. So I think there is you know reason to be really optimistic about this. But because this is also being run by an entrepreneur, you know, a technologist rather than a scientist in a lab, it moves a lot more quickly than say scientists are used to. So we have to kind of be as cautious. Um, with the kind of venture capital money flowing into it um, and the fact that it's being pushed forward by technologists rather than scientists. And is that something that worries you, Wendy, um, that, that, you know, we're just not managing this in the way that, that we should be? I know you say some of this technology is, is decades away, but we're also hearing that, that, you know, computers could potentially, AI could be potentially, you know, smarter than humans in, in just a few years. Mm. Scientists have to be aware of what the things they're in, uh, working on in this area. I think it's just, you know, you see things, they always start in the labs in universities and then go into the big research labs in the companies and then go commercial. And we have to, at the very, you know, we have to get people very aware that if you're trying to build something that is as intelligent or more intelligent than a human being, and you've got to, you have, there are social consequences to that. We have to be, we have to guide the scientists as much as, uh, as when it gets commercial and, and goes much faster. Yeah, and um, Marimita, you know, all of these things are currently being discussed, debated and taking place, but do you believe that we should be excited or, or, or you know, cautious at this stage moving forward? So I think that, you know, um, the example we've been discussing with Neuralink shows some of the very real opportunities that do exist when it comes to AI technologies, particularly, I think, in the areas of scientific advancement and healthcare. But even before that, there's the question of who's accountable when these technologies make decisions or have outputs that affect us, whether that's our kids in their education or doctors in a hospital. You know, who's in charge? Is there anybody there who can say that's the wrong answer? Um, so we really need to think about it from a social, societal perspective. How, do, how much power do we want to, an agency do we want to give machines in decisions that are usually, you know, kind of in the domain of human experts and build any regulation around that? But it starts with us. Madhumita, Wendy, thank you both for joining us. Thank you. That was AI editor at the FT, Madhumita Mogia, and a computer scientist, Dame Wendy Hall. This is The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Next up, the family of a British woman who's missing in the US Virgin Islands asks President Biden to help find her. We'll bring you the story of Sam Heslop, who was last seen in 2021.
Welcome back. Next tonight, the story of Sam Heslop, the British woman missing in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Three years uh, since her disappearance, her family are now pressing Joe Biden to help find her. Sam's mother believes she was killed and wants police to launch a murder investigation. Our U.S. correspondent Martha Kellner has the story. Sam Heslop was living what seemed to be her dream life in the US Virgin Islands. A former air hostess from Southampton, she'd moved to the Caribbean to be with her new boyfriend, Ryan Bain. They lived together on this boat, but in March 2021, in the dead of night, Sam disappeared from the catamaran. Three years on, she is still officially missing, but her mum, Brenda, believes she was killed. I do believe she was murdered and there are places where people can be put in the ocean and never found. And I believe that's what happened. I'd like to just bring her home. I can grieve then. I haven't grieved. Yes, I've been sad. I can't grieve because I don't have her. Ryan Bain reported Sam missing to police at 2.30 a.m. saying he woke up to find her gone. He was advised to tell the Coast Guard, but reportedly didn't do so until nine hours later. When they eventually boarded the boat, a Coast Guard report alleges he was drunk and prevented a search of the cabin. Island police have never interviewed him, never forensically searched the boat and refused assistance from the FBI. They have not done their jobs as police officers. They've not done their jobs as human beings. Speaking from the UK, Brenda says she wants the US authorities to remove the case from Virgin Islands police. Would you like President Biden and the White House to intervene in this? Absolutely. I even emailed Biden, who didn't reply. You know, I was asking for his assistance, for, for somebody, some department of his to help us. I want people of a higher power to bring him in and interview him. I travelled to Lake Orion in Michigan, Ryan Bain's hometown, in search of him. He remains a person of interest in the case, but not a suspect. He was recently spotted in a gym and in local bars here, but has since gone underground. We're sorry. He doesn't respond to my emails or phone calls. He's registered as living at an address here with his parents, Fred and Joyce. At first, they deny who they are. Mr and Mrs Bain? No, you've got the wrong people. I think I've got the right people. Um, My last name is Clack, C-L-A-C-K. OK, so you're not the parents of Ryan Bain? No. Did Ryan have anything to do with Sam's disappearance? Did Ryan have anything...? Sorry, sir, did Ryan have anything to do with Sam's disappearance? Will he talk to the police? What happened to the boat? What happened to the boat, sir? Please don't snatch my microphone. Will Ryan answer questions? You're intruding in my personal I'm, space. I'm, I'm not. I'll stand, stand back here. Back. OK, I'll stand back here. Where has the boat gone, Mr Bain? Will Ryan answer questions to the Virgin Islands Police Department? Where is your son, Mr Bain? Ryan Bain has a domestic violence conviction. In 2011, he was jailed for assaulting his ex-wife, Corrie Stevenson. Sam's family have been working with a former Met Police commander to try and break the stalemate in her case. She may have fallen overboard. I think that's highly unlikely. It's always been my belief that, uh, and, and we avoid trying to rush to conclusions, but the hypothesis has to be that a second party was involved uh, in her um, disappearance and possibly her death. In a statement, a lawyer for Ryan Bain said, while we empathise with Sam's family's frustration, Ryan Bain had nothing to do with Sam's disappearance. Ryan is heartbroken that Sam went missing. The Coast Guard was twice on the vessel conducting a search and questioning Ryan. They had unfettered access to the vessel and Ryan answered all questions posed to him. The Virgin Islands Police Department didn't respond to repeated requests for comment. The search for Sam and for justice continues. The Foreign Office says it is assisting with the case. But for now, Sam's family are left with more questions than answers. Martha Kellner, Sky News. This is The World with me, Yalda Hakim. Next up, the US ramps up the pressure on Israel. Secretary of State Antony Blinken pushes for an immediate ceasefire and a deal to free hostages in Gaza as more than one million people in the Strip face catastrophic levels of hunger.
I don't think we can completely ban junk food in supermarkets, but we can certainly do a lot more in terms of educating people of what they can buy. Because you can actually go into a supermarket and buy very, very healthy food. You know, you don't actually have to go for the junk. But if people don't know how, within their very busy and time-poor lives, how to build in those really healthy foods, the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains, we are a nation deficient in fibre, people will really, really struggle with their health. They'll continue to go for that junk food because they think it's the easiest thing. It's about letting people make choices about their own lives. And you know, we've got to be treating adults like adults. And you know, arguing these ideas effectively, saying that actually what the solution should be is that we should be banning uh, junk food, we should be taking it away from people. We already tax sugar a huge amount. So effectively, it means that your, your, your Coke is more expensive than your Coke Zero. And what that means is that we are putting up the price for everyday people I say let people make their own health choices sometimes people want to eat chocolate and I think we should let them mm. I do think we should let look I love chocolate as well and I do sometimes love a bit of junk food it's not always about eating super healthy junk food, food to you? oh some junk food to me so sometimes I'll have a healthier treat and that might be dates and nut butter but sometimes I do want to have some chocolate cake yes I'll pick the plant-based chocolate cake but it's not the healthiest thing. Mm. But in the most part, I'm going for those plant-based whole foods which give me thriving health. And I see people day in, day out, struggling with their health. These are intelligent people. They don't want to be eating the junk food, but they don't understand what else to eat within their busy lives. And the things they can actually pick in the supermarkets, I can send them to a slightly different aisle, and they don't realise the incredible food that exists. Well, I, I, think, I think it's really insulting to be telling people that they are, you know, they are too, they, they don't understand what's going on, they don't understand what's in the supermarket, they don't understand what healthy food looks like. There are, there are very clever people like you online that are going to be able to tell them. These, the resources out there are numerous. You can go online, search online, and find out exactly how to create healthy alternatives, how to create healthy recipes. And actually, I think I think it's really insulting. We've ended up in this culture where effectively we're expecting the government to control our healthcare and life choices. Welcome back. With me in the studio tonight is Deputy Editor of The Spectator, Freddie Gray, and Michael Walker, political commentator at Navarra Media. Now, their thoughts in a moment, but first a development in efforts to secure a ceasefire in Gaza and the possibility of a new vote by the UN Security Council. The details of that in a second. First, his Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, speaking today in Cairo. Have a listen. There's a clear consensus around a number of shared priorities. First, the need for an immediate, sustained ceasefire with the release of hostages. Uh, that would create space to surge more humanitarian assistance to relieve uh, the suffering of many people and to build something more enduring. Secretary of State Tony Blinken there. Well, let's go straight to the United States and bring in our Mark Stone. And Mark, after six months, we are starting to now see a significant shift in the U.S. position. Yes, uh, remember that all other resolutions that have been brought by a number of different countries over the past few months that have called for a ceasefire have been vetoed by the United States, a permanent member. It's able to veto uh, and it has done so. Uh, the reason for that is it never believed that then was the moment for a ceasefire. Two things have changed. One, the Americans have become increasingly frustrated uh, with the Israelis, um, which has pushed their, their language that they are using on the floor of the Security Council. 
um, against Israel, you could argue, a um, harder line against Israel. Uh, that is what we have seen in this latest resolution. They have molded the language, uh, which is more hard line uh, in terms of its uh, America's position uh, about it, the way Israel is conducting itself. The other thing that I think is happening is that uh, the, the, the ceasefire talks that are ongoing in, um, in the Middle East, in, in Do Doha and in Cairo, they appear to be getting closer as well. Uh, and so I think the Americans are now trying to marry all this together uh, and cre have created, over many weeks, moulded language in a resolution which has been changed many times behind the scenes to find language which they hope that all sides uh, can agree on. This, will vote, this vote will go ahead uh, tomorrow, 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock. Watch, though, uh, because I wonder whether the Russians, who have the, the, the power to veto, may well veto this, which, which would seem surprising, uh, but uh, they will what not want to, to allow America to dig themselves out of their own hole. Uh, the Americans will see it as deeply cynical, but the Russians have the ear of the Arab bloc. Now, if the Arab bloc are not happy with any of the language in this resolution, if they believe that it is too aligned to Israel still, they could pressure the Russians to veto it. It could get messy, uh, and we'll bring it all to you tomorrow. Yeah, Mark, thank you so much. As you say, it could get messy. Uh, we will be watching and listening and getting analysis from you uh, tomorrow. Thanks so much. Now, all that comes after a new British field hospital was constructed in the Strip, staffed by NHS doctors. Our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle, has more. This is the new British Field Hospital being constructed in southern Gaza. It's being staffed by NHS doctors flown in from the UK. We have a number of family doctor stations which gradually will become an emergency department as the hospital becomes fully operational. <laughs> They're working around the clock to get it built. Once fully operational, probably in the next four or five days, they'll be able to care for 250 patients a day here. Further down, this building here is going to be an inpatient ward. So we will have three wards. You can see that there are three entranceways, three different wards, and there will be 12 beds in each ward. So 36 patients in here. For thousands, this will become the only hospital that they can get easy or safe access to. The hospitals are far away. We have no transportation. Also, they're quite busy because there are so many wounded people being treated there. We are suffering because of living in camps, because of malnutrition. We are always ill. My son, who has just been treated, is always ill. I have three older sons at home, all ill. Jabalia camp in northern Gaza is where the humanitarian crisis is at its worst. There's only one road here for aid trucks, and they've often struggled to get into the north, either stopped by the IDF or unable to go forward because of the security situation. 70% of people in northern Gaza are said to be on the brink of starvation. And today, the British Foreign Secretary accused Israel of closing its border crossing on Saturdays and said that some British aid had been waiting at the border for almost three weeks for Israel to let it in. The United Nations told us that Israel was rejecting many essential items. For a full range of nutritional support and for medical support, we need to get the private sector, the pharmacies and other places and other outlets working. People focus on food, of course, but it's, it's not just food. No. There's all sorts of stuff that needs to go in. Is that being allowed in, or are you finding a lot of stuff being rejected? Well, there's a lot of stuff getting rejected for water and sanitation and for health systems. Um, and the, particularly, you have like solar panels and for things like generators, spare parts for water and sanitation systems. They're blocked. Chemicals for treating water are blocked as well. The simple reality is that the less food there is, the greater the desperation and the worse the security becomes. It's a vicious circle in a vicious war. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News, in Jerusalem. Well, Freddie and Michael are here with me in the studio. Um, Freddie, the humanitarian catastrophe continues to unfold while the politics is also playing out. Yes, well, I think particularly uh, when the diplomacy is concerned with the Middle East, uh, you have to look a little bit behind what's going on in the language. I mean, you hear Blinken talking 
uh, there. And the US certainly does seem to be ratcheting up the pressure. I think that's real. Um, but then if you go back to Biden's State of the Union, a much more telling moment of how Biden actually thinks was that hot mic moment. I don't know if you saw it when uh, he was talking to a Democratic senator who was concerned about the humanitarian situation. And he said, I've said to Bibi, we're going to have to uh, have to have a come to Jesus moment. And I think that tells you a little bit about how negotiations are going on between Netanyahu and Biden, who are quite close. They've always had quite a good relationship. It's that Biden is saying to Israel, I've got a problem on my left politically. I've got an election coming up. Uh, I'm getting a lot of flack for this. I can't cover for you for much longer. And Netanyahu is actually quite relieved for, as people in Israel tell me, is quite relieved to have this American criticism because he's actually quite apprehensive about going into Rafa. He knows that that war is going to get very, very messy very, very quickly. Uh, and so America's uh, objections give him the, the excuse he has to not go further quickly. That, that's interesting. I've not heard that perspective. Well, I, I, I personally think there's a danger in overstating the significance of this UN resolution because if they're only saying, and I mean, it's, it's still only being reported, we haven't seen sort of the final wording, but if it's, if it's saying we want a ceasefire and we want the release of the hostages, then Israel can say, well, we're not going to have a ceasefire unless there is the release of the hostages. And what Netanyahu wants to do um, and what Hamas is sort of opposed to is to say, we'll have a six-week ceasefire, you release all the hostages, and then we'll destroy you. Now, that's not something which Hamas are going to agree to, right? Because they give up all their leverage and then say, well, you're going to come back in six well, weeks' time and, 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 and kill us anyway. Yeah. So uh, I think for a strong resolution at the UN from the US, and which I think the entire West should back, is to say an immediate and unconditional ceasefire. Because I think we're in a dangerous situation where we have kind of normalised a war which kills 30,000 people as a legitimate response to a hostage crisis, right? Now, obviously, civilians being taken hostage is a war crime. It's outrageous. But we, we don't normally have an understanding in international law or sort of international norms that when people are taken hostages, you can do whatever you want until those hostages are released. I want to get your thoughts on that. Well, I think it's an intractable situation because uh, whatever happens in Israel, even if Netanyahu is replaced, uh, the public appetite to destroy Hamas is overwhelming um, and you're not going to be able to stop that and all international posturing is not going to stop that. Um, the only thing that would actually stop that is if America threatened serious sanctions itself, not through international agencies or even military intervention to stop it. That's not going to happen anytime soon. So I think you've got a situation where you'll have a lot of international bleating um, and nobody actually trying to stop Israel if it does go ahead uh, with an invasion of Rafa. And the key thing to watch is uh, the neighbouring Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE, because they are going to object publicly as much as possible. Um, but if you talk to Qataris who are involved in this, they'll tell you that behind the scenes, Saudi Arabia and Qatar are actually turning a perfectly blind eye to this. But just very briefly, I've got about 10 seconds left. You're saying that Netanyahu doesn't actually want to go based on what your sources are saying. I think Netanyahu is very nervous about the situation he's got himself in. He's got uh, people within his own administration who are effectively Jewish supremacists, um, who are quite willing to, to carry out acts of um, great, great atrocities against Palestinian people. Uh, I think he is very cynical in the way he operates, uh, and I think he's quite grateful for a that, bit of American a, resistance. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, Freddie, Michael, we'll have to leave it there. We're really grateful that you've both uh, joined us here on the programme. Now, that's all for tonight's programme. News at 10 is next with calls for the government to pay out bills to women who lost out on their pensions. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again on Monday. Good night.